I mentioned prior to us coming on about kind of your life flashing before you and talking about the North Hollywood shootout. We were talking about that earlier. And because I had come on right um, during the North Hollywood shootout time, we were wearing very heavy, thick ceramic trauma plates at that time. So in addition to um, all of my ballistic gear and my gun belts, um, I had this very thick, heavy ceramic trauma plate that I was wearing. Um, so as soon as I collided, my car again started to spin, it started to upend, and it started to um, really just, all I saw was glass and debris and everything completely slowed down. Um, because of the mechanism of injury and how I decelerated so quickly, um, kind of all of my internal organs all all just kind of um, you know, went into shock. And the, because of the deceleration, that trauma plate had actually gone into uh, part of my chest wall and it had ruptured um, the pericardium, which is the sac around the heart. Um, at that time, we had our shotguns that were up behind our car where we would release them with a foot pedal. So the shotgun comes down, hits me in the back of the head, and, and I now have this, this brain um, injury. And I'm in and out of consciousness. And at that time, again, I just remembered the spin and it was just spinning and spinning. And by the time I lost consciousness, um, there was a very large tree that had apparently come through and hit the A-pillar, caved in the A-pillar of the car, and then come through the back uh, cage where um, we would place suspects that were in custody. Um, And then the vehicle came to rest. And then everything was silent. Welcome to the Transition Drill Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Pantiani. I appreciate you taking the time to watch. So let's get into this. In your book, you talk about being involved in weightlifting or strength training, even back in high school. Mm-hmm. Where did that come from? Interesting. So in order to keep myself out of trouble, I decided that I would do something that was productive and also something that kept me out of the house. Um, my mother at that time had gone through a couple of different relationships and home was a little bit chaotic. So it was a way for me to kind of get some stress out. It was a way for me to um, do something again that was productive and not destructive. And it was a way for me to stay out of the chaos. And so I started um, actually deadlifting and bench pressing. And at the time, I don't think I still hold the record, but at the time my max deadlift was 385. And um, it was an incredible accomplishment. And it was something I was very proud of. And I need to double check now and see if I still hold the record because I'm pretty sure that I am still not able to do 385 ever (laughs) again, but it was uh, a way for me again to just kind of refocus. It was a way for me to do something that was good for my body. It was good for my mind and it was good for me socializing as well. Um, when you kind of grow up in a chaotic home, your social skills become a little bit maladaptive. And so finding common energy with people that are in the same space, that are doing the same things was just a really, really, really great way, or, again, for me to stay out of trouble <laughs> throughout high school. And it really was something that I remained focused on throughout my adult life. And I love weightlifting to this day. I do have some physical limitations as a result of my crash. And I think we're going to talk about that. But beyond that, again, it's just something that it feels so good to get those neurochemicals going, to get kind of that dopamine, to get the serotonin going. And it, and it just really kind of helps, I think, with inflammation and also with physical pain um, to have all those good neurochemicals going when you exercise hard. I guess what struck me is, and, and this may even sound a little sexist, but as a young girl in high school, a petite mm-hmm. girl, to go towards weightlifting just kind of doesn't doesn't fit into the norm. <laughs> I think I'm anything but normal. <laughs> um, so great, great, great question. So um, I wanted to do something where I felt empowered and powerful. I felt very powerless in my home environment. Again, it was very chaotic. Um, I am a physical and sexual abuse victim. And again, that just continued kind of the chaos. And so doing something that was outside the box, outside the norm, and something that made me feel powerful and made me feel in control was really important for me. 
So then let's take it all the way back. Where did you grow up? Where is hometown for you? So I was born in Alabama. Uh, I know you you will miss the y'all drawl. <laughs> um, did you make a conscious effort to get rid of it? <laughs> I did. I did. I did. Um, so left Alabama very early. Uh, parents divorced and uh, moved to Texas. We happened to move to Texas during, I think, um, the worst hurricane season or rainy season they had ever had. And so didn't stay in Texas long and made our way to California in the early seventies and stayed in California. And again, um, my, my mother had a series of relationships and some of them, uh, were not great relationships. Some of them were abusive relationships, uh, not only to her, but also to myself. And then going through that entire process in very, early years of my teens um, really just helped me to understand, okay, no one's coming to help me. No one's coming to take care of me. No one's going to protect me. So I need to gain the tools to do it myself. And I thought strength and strength training was a really incredible way to navigate that. So that's, that's hence the strength training avenue um, because I felt powerful and I felt like I could take care of myself. And, and if I needed to um, physically, um, you know, subdue someone, then it would be easy to do the stronger I was. Was with the abuse that was going on, mm -hmm. were you protected by your mom or was your mom not looking out for you? She was doing the best she could at the time with this coping skills that she had. Um, she somewhat looked the other way. And then when she found some, further evidence that the abuse was occurring. Um, that's when we reported it to the police department. And I went through the whole covert call and went through the entire investigative process. And um, her husband was arrested and he was sentenced and he did some time in prison. Um, and at the time though, things like Megan's Law didn't exist and things for sex offenders, there was no continuing sexual abuse of a child. There were not things that um, there are today in place to protect victims of abuse. And so um, his sentence was very light. It was only three years. And then there was a probationary period after the fact. And um, once he was released from custody, um, I have no idea what happened to him. Um, my mother died a couple of years later. Um, she developed pancreatic cancer and she passed away at the very tender age of 43. Um, but I also think a lot of the stress that she endured as the result of not only her kind of chaotic relationships and abusive relationships, but also, you know, some of the things that happened with me, I think, you know, I, I believe that stress and trauma kind of manifest themselves internally and physiologically. And so um, I think that uh, she had a very challenging life, a very difficult life. And again, she was doing the best she could at the time with the skills that she had. But there were certainly things that looking back on it, she could have done to have better protected me from her husband. Brothers, sisters? I have a brother. Uh, he is a chief of police. So uh, law enforcement kind of runs in the family. Um, I had a younger half brother. Um, my younger half brother sadly uh, had some demons and some addictions and he did some time um, in prison, uh, many years in prison actually. And he was released from custody and decided that he was going to go out partying with some friends and they got drunk and high and he crashed and sadly he and his passenger were killed uh, upon impact and that was in 2006. And that's it. It's just, just the two brothers and I. As a young girl, obviously dealing with a lot of trauma at home and, and we've talked about the weightlifting to, to a sense develop your own sense of control. But what else kind of took up your time? Did you enjoy school? Did you play any other sports? Uh, I played softball for a while and I really sucked at it. So I decided I needed to do something that I was really good at. And again, that was weightlifting at the time. Um, I tried a variety of different sports and uh, truly wasn't really good at any of them. Um, there was soccer for a couple of seasons. Again, softball, which I was terrible at. I was always... Um, what is it? I was always in the outfield because <laughs> I could never catch anything to save my life. Um, and then really just weightlifting became just really focused effort on that because everything else was just kind of noise and, and um, just stuff to keep me busy. So really weightlifting um, and 
then as I moved through kind of adulthood, um, stayed active, stayed physically fit. Again, had some challenging things after my pursuit crash where I wasn't able to lift anymore the way that I had previously. Um, And then in those moments, I really focused on things like yoga, meditation, kind of these mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques. And um, I know I I certainly think we're going to be diving more into that once we talk about um, my book. But those were the things that really got me through some of the challenges where I could not only have a strong body, but also calm my mind. Coming out of, what year did you graduate high school? I graduated in 1990. And coming out of high school, what what was your plans for adulthood at that point? <laughs> or did you have any? I did not have any. Um, I think at the time, the topic of the day that was exciting to study was international marketing. I don't even know what that is today. I don't think it even exists any longer. So um, went to community college uh, here and there and then decided that I wanted to go into law enforcement and made my way into some testing processes for a couple different agencies. Um, at the time, my brother was in law enforcement and he and I are very close and he's been somewhat of a mentor to me. And I decided I was going to follow in Big Brother's footsteps and went to the academy Got hired in L.A. County. Um, I worked in L.A. County for 10 years. And during those days, it was, um, again, very early to mid-90s. Policing was a little bit different in L.A. County, (laughs) (laughs) Um, and especially for a female. uh, What year did you come on? So, 95. So, just a little after Rodney King. So, you were still feeling some of the effects of that. Yes, Absolutely. And we bordered LAPD on several sides for the agency that I was working for at the time. So um, a lot of um, distrust between police and the community, um, a lot of um, just, again, kind of a time of, of adjustment, kind of a time where, you know, community policing wasn't really a buzzword back in those days, but we were doing it. You know, we were out, we were walking footbeats, we were connecting with our communities, we were doing all the right things and saying all the right things to move past some of those very challenging events that had happened between the community and the police. Um, And really, as you know, that something bad happens in law enforcement and we're all painted with a very broad brush. And even though we weren't there and we didn't have anything to do with it, um, we somehow become, um, you know, subject of um, the ire of, of the public. So um, had a great, great, great first decade uh, in law enforcement. Um, It was fun it was, you know, driving fast, kicking doors, making arrests. It, I worked graveyard, I think, the entire 10 years because uh, that's where I wanted to be. You know, that's where all the action was. That's where all the excitement was. Um, and it was incredible. And then about, gosh, it'll be coming up on almost 21 years now. Um, it was April 16th of 2000. And I was um, working graveyard, of course, because I loved graveyard. And uh, we get a call. That's uh, just what they tell you as a young officer. <laughs> That's exactly it's the best right. shift you can work. Ever. Right. Um, so we ended up getting uh, a call mm. of um, a Grand Theft Auto slash robbery that had just occurred. And it was about 3.23 in the morning to be exact. <laughs> and uh, it had just started to rain just enough. And, you know, April, we're kind of moving from, from you know, the cold winter months and, you know, three o'clock in the morning, it was still very cold, um, heavy, 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 dense fog. Um, and you have a little bit of uh, rain introduced, uh, just enough to make the roadways pretty slick. And uh, so myself and one of our partners get in pursuit and we're going upwards of gosh, 111 between anywhere from 94 to 111 miles an hour. Um, I had a brand new Ford crown Victoria. I think it had 43 miles on it when I went 10, eight that night. Um, that's a whole other sad story, but, uh, nonetheless, um, we're navigating these, these incredibly high speeds. And uh, for those that are familiar with the uh, Dodger stadium area, so Riverside and stadium way, um, you have some like pretty significant 90 degree turns, um, up in that area. And so, um, you know, navigating those speeds with a wet roadway, um, is a recipe for disaster. And I overdrove my capabilities. Um, I got tunnel vision. I was a young 20 something cop and I was like, how dare you run from the police? And, you know, we're going to get you. Um, so suspects crash and foot bail and partner officers, um, start to engage them to chase them up, up and around everywhere through Dodger, throughout Dodger stadium. 
Um, and right as I'm coming around the last turn, um, there was some oil from the suspect's car from their collision that had dropped into the roadway. And I was, again, navigating speeds of, you know, 90 to 110 miles an hour. Um, and my car started to go into an irrecoverable spin. Um, and at that time, you mentioned, um, you know, kind of, or I'm sorry, I mentioned prior to us coming on about kind of your life flashing before you and talking about the North Hollywood shootout. We were talking about that earlier. And because I had come on right um, during the North Hollywood shootout time, we were wearing very heavy, thick ceramic trauma plates at that time. So in addition to um, all of my ballistic gear and my gun belts, um, I had this very thick, heavy ceramic trauma plate that I was wearing. Um, so as soon as I collided, my car again started to spin, it started to upend, and it started to um, really just, all I saw was glass and debris and everything completely slowed down. Um, because of the mechanism of injury and how I decelerated so quickly, um, kind of all of my internal organs all, all just kind of, um, you know, went into shock. And the, because of the deceleration, that trauma plate had actually gone into uh, part of my chest wall and it had ruptured um, the pericardium, which is the sac around the heart. Um, at that time, we had our shotguns that were up behind our car where we would release them with a foot pedal. So the shotgun comes down, hits me in the back of the head, and, and I now have this, this brain um, injury. And I'm in and out of consciousness. And at that time, again, I just remembered the spin and it was just spinning and spinning. And by the time I lost consciousness, um, there was a very large tree that had apparently come through and hit the A-pillar, caved in the A-pillar of the car, and then come through the back uh, cage where um, we would place suspects that were in custody. Um, and then the vehicle came to rest. And then everything was silent. And I don't remember much after that. Um, I remember waking up. And for those that are not familiar with brain injuries, one of the things that happens is you wake up combative. Um, and, you know, one of the things I was telling you in the academy is weapon retention, right? So gun retention, gun retention, weapon retention. And there was an LAPD sergeant who had gotten down into the car with me. And I remember him talking to me. I remember him holding my hand. I remember him telling me to stay awake and I remember him picking glass out of my face. And then I remember them starting to cut off my uniform. Now, why they do that? I don't know. Those <laughs> things are expensive, you know, but in, that's a whole other story. Um, I'm grateful to their rescue efforts. Otherwise I, I wouldn't be here today. So all kidding aside, they're absolute heroes and I'm so grateful. Um, so they're cutting off my uniform and they're trying to take my gun belt off and I'm fighting. I'm fighting to keep my weapon because I don't know what's happening. I'm scared. I literally have lost consciousness. I have this brain injury and, and I have all these internal injuries. And um, I remember going to LA County USC. Um, it took me right into emergency and I stayed there for several days. They were able to stabilize me. Um, I had pretty much broken everything on the right side of my body. I had broken um, my shoulder, my knee, um, I had a significant hip um, and pelvic injury. Um, I had the heart injury, as I shared earlier. And then um, ultimately, they found that I had um, herniations in both my neck and my back. Um, I still do have those today, um, which is why physical fitness has become even more important than ever. Um, but navigating through all of that, um, one of the things that happened was it was really a challenge for me to continue to work out, which is really my way of kind of coping with stress. And now you have the stress of chronic pain. You have the stress of working through, do I have to retire? Am I ever going to be able to go back to work? What does this look like? What does the rest of my life look like? Um, I ended up being on some different heart medications and I had irregular heart rhythms for quite a while. And at the time, I remember getting a phone call. I was released from uh, LA County USC went to um, St. Joe's in Burbank, and I stayed there for several days after. How long total were you in the hospital? I believe it was about 10 days. And in your book, you you address, and for those who are unaware of it, the book is Body, Mind, and Badge. And from this story, there's pictures of yes. the damage to your car, so you can see what happened to it. But one of the things you mentioned is that the doctors said because of your strength training, because of your working yeah. out, those muscles actually protected more bones from breaking. Absolutely. And um, again, deadlifting, squatting, um, 
all of these are large muscle groups. The quads are, you know, very large muscle groups. And one of the things that, that happened too, the reason the knee broke and the, the hip injury, um, it's at the time we had our mobile data terminals and they were on, you know, our right-hand side where we have to lean down and we have to, you know, um, type leaning over to the right. And so because the car hit so many different points of impact, it caved in um, really on both sides, but the most significant was the driver's side, um, a pillar and um, driver's compartment. And so that then meant that all of these heavy, heavy, heavy muscle groups, because they were big and conditioned and because I was doing so much quad work and because I was doing so much with my hamstrings and glutes at that time, they said that the not only the mass, but also um, kind of the elasticity is what allowed those objects to kind of really just bounce right off. And it actually saved me from having um, a broken femur and a crushed pelvis. So I was very, very, very thankful at that time for how, how I had continued this, you know, lifelong love of weightlifting because it, I truly believe it saved my life. Were you going back to the weightlifting just real quick? Were you actually training to compete? Not really. I was in some local competitions here and there, um, but nothing, nothing significant. Really, it was just more of a way of um, feeling good and coping and feeling strong. So you spent 10 days in the hospital after yes. the, the in and out of consciousness. Did that last through the multiple days or, or how soon were you Lucid. conscious and, and aware of what was going on on a consistent basis? Um, I would say the first probably 24 to 36 hours, I was really in and out of consciousness. Um, I remember waking up on day two, um, and as anyone who's been injured knows, uh, waking up on day two is horrific. Um, that's the time when, you know, the adrenaline has kind of settled and um, all the bumps and the bruises, you know, really, really, really start to um, release <laughs> their wrath on, on the body. And so um, I had also been very, 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 um, gosh, I, I, I would say, I don't want to say angry, but I, I was, I was the injustice of it all. So the crash, the fact that the folks that we were crashed, that we were chasing were out of custody before I was out of the hospital. Um, I started to really dwell on that and it really, 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 um, put me in not a great place mentally and emotionally. Um, and it took me quite a while to actually get over that piece of it. Again, I just thought there's such injustice, you know, we're the police, you don't run from the police and, and now all these terrible things have happened. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I was the one operating the vehicle. So holding myself accountable, I overdrove my capabilities, right? right. I got this tunnel vision. Um, I talk a little bit about that in the book as well and really just overcoming, you know, that tunnel vision. And so for anyone out there who's still, uh, you know, boots on the ground and still out there patrolling, um, really, really, really take a step back to take that deep breath and to really just step back and reflect on, okay, do not allow yourself to get tunnel vision during, um, you know, high speed driving, during a critical incident, you know, always make sure to, you know, kind of look at the scenario, but also look beyond the scenario and really just try to understand, okay, what impact or what ripples is, is this going to cause if I do this or if I do that, you know, and really understanding how our actions impact others um, is one thing that I would share. Um, and I, I talk a little bit about that in the book, but um, since we're here and for your listeners, um, well, and the, and the thing is, is and, and not to take this political because I don't, um, but what you just said applies to so many things. Mm -hmm. Your incident involved a driving situation that you overdrove your capabilities of you and your car. Mm -hmm. And your actions have then ramifications. Yes. But it's 2023. If you don't if you're not aware of your actions and the ramifications that they have on you, your career and your agency, you know, Absolutely. it's going to, it's definitely going to circle back around on you. So Absolutely. Absolutely. It, the, for you and somebody dealing with this from the law enforcement perspective, you're now injured. You're now, let's even say you're, you're 11 days out. So you're out of the hospital. You've got three different things you're dealing with. There is your mental mindset and coming back from this. Right. There's the medical side of it and what they think you're going to be able to come back from. And then there's your organization. Right. So I, w I want to address all three. Okay. 
which came first in this? Was there ever a point where the the pressure was you're going to have to retire? Yes. Who did it come from first, the doctors or your organization, or was it you? the organization? So they thought you were done. Yes, um, because of the magnitude of the heart injury, and because I was taking um, heart medication at the time, um, it was an injury that they perceived to be irrecoverable, and that one that I would struggle with um, for really the rest of my life. And I do struggle with um, heart issues still, but not to the degree that they were back then. The injury was fresh; it was raw, um, and you know my body just needed the time to heal. And uh, that's that was not. Um, a luxury that really was afforded. It was, all right, you're going to be in runs of, you know, tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia or atrial fibrillation for, um, you know, the rest of your life. We're not sure what this looks like. Uh, By the way, here's a halter monitor. Uh, Put it on your chest and we'll see how many different irregular arrhythmias that you're having. Uh, Here's some medication. And because you're on this medication, um, one of the medications what it does is it actually takes blood from your extremities. It's called the vasovagal dilator, right? So it takes blood from your extremities and it moves it to your core. And that allows the red blood cells and, and all the different things to exchange so that you can heal. Um, but sadly, someone who is um, entrusted with um, carrying a firearm and also driving heavy equipment, um, sometimes there are issues where there is a loss of consciousness um, because of the way that the blood diverts to fix whatever the issue is. So at that time, they said, hey, you know, we can't have you carrying a firearm and we can't have you driving. So I was really desk bound, right? And I- I'm right handed and I had broken my shoulder and my knee. And so I was still recovering from all of those things orthopedically. But I would say that the visit from the workers' comp um, representative came very soon after I was released from the hospital and the news was what I heard, whether or not is what was said, (laughs) but what I heard was you can never go back to work again. What else do you want to do with your life? And we have vocational rehabilitation available to you. And that just, it didn't compute for me. I, I, I truly, I don't think I responded or processed the question very well because I instantly got angry and I said, you haven't even given me the chance to heal I'm coming back to work. How long after the crash was this conversation? Do you remember? Gosh, it was probably a couple months. Okay. Um, and I just got angry and I said, you know, you need to leave. Um, I, I asked my, I asked her to leave my house. I said, um, I am, I will come back. I will be the one that comes back. And, um, certainly maybe not, the best of responses I could have had at that time. But again, I was young and I'm not in a great place and I'm hurting and I'm in chronic pain. And, you know, that does a lot for you mentally and emotionally. Um, and I didn't know what to do after that. And I decided that if I was going to have to retire and I was going to have to medical out that I needed something to fall back on, I had nothing to fall back on. Um, Remember I shared with you after high school, I dabbled in, you know, international marketing classes here and there. Uh, It does nothing for you, by the (laughs) way, um, as far as life plans and what that looks like to support yourself and your family if I was going to have to medically retire. Because back then, and I believe it's still the case today, you know, this was early 2000s and medical um, is about, you know, half of what you're making at that time. And, and it would not have sustained me um, without finding alternative employment. So I decided to go back to school and it was during my recovery that I enrolled in um, an associates program and decided that I was going to, I was going to go for it. So you hadn't been thinking about college not. Other than taking a couple classes when you first got out of high school? Not at all. The only thing that I cared about as far as education was, was ever continuing education that we had to take to remain, you know, certificated peace officers. Um, were you it. on light duty still at this point? Obviously. I or, was. So you, were you back in the station doing any type of work or were you completely out of the office? Uh, I was, I think I was back on the desk. Um, so we were working three twelves at that time and, um, it was easy for me to, you know, take a you know, Tuesday morning, you know, Wednesday morning, 7am class and work my Thursday, Friday, Saturday graveyard shift. Um, so I was light duty and I ended up going back after full duty. It took me about 
right about nine months to get back to full duty. So you, you were able to actually make it back, obviously full duty. What was that battle like? Because obviously workers comp saying you can't, then they're representing the city correct? and you've now became a line item on their budget. Mm-hmm. And it's cheaper to get rid of you than to try to get you back Correct. from the agency side. Were they supportive of you coming back? Did you get support? I don't think I felt like that at the time. Uh, in retrospect, um, I feel like, again, it was kind of these competing elements of get in. It is cheaper to get rid of those that are, you know, long term injuries and get them off of the books um, than it is to bring them back and, and to rehabilitate. Um, you know, therapy was expensive. All the equipment was expensive. The medications were expensive. You know, all the things to recover were expensive. Um, I didn't necessarily feel the love when I went back. Um, but again, I came back nonetheless, and um, I stayed there for another, gosh, probably four years. Um, ended up laddering to an Orange County agency in 2004. Um, and, you know, at the, at the end of the day, um, my injuries at that time did not preclude me from laddering to another organization, but they are things that I still struggled with. Um, you know, you can hear me walking down the stairs in the morning because it's Rice Krispies, right? It's, you know, snap, crackle, pop. Um, I hate to break it to you. I haven't been in that bad of an accident. That's my knees also. So I think that's just age. I agreed. I agreed. Um, and you know, I, I am, I'm in the midst of, um, having some, some issues with my heart again and, you know, kind of navigating through that. And that's a little scary, you know, cause you just, you never know what's going to happen. Um, but as far as orthopedically, um, I've had, um, all kinds of um, success with, you know, injectables and um, as far as like, you know, cortisone and things. So when there are flare ups, um, you know, of the knee, the back, the hip, uh, the shoulder, um, you know, cortisone has been able to kind of remedy, you know, and, and, um, and again, I worked another 15 years and then decided, you know, I went to school and now I need to think about well, what's, what's after law enforcement. And now what? So, Can I take you back just yeah, real quick? Yeah, please. So for somebody who might be in the, the midst of dealing with a significant injury like you dealt with. Yes. What was your mental mindset like from the, you said from the get go, you didn't want to retire, but obviously going through that nine months to get back to full duty. Did you have your moments of maybe I can't? And then you mentioned, obviously we've talked about having done strength training in the past, but you had to kind of transition at least initially to using yoga. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to get into, was that something you sought out on your own or did you get somebody in your ear kind of going, Hey, you you can't do this yet. Why don't you give yoga a try? Right. Uh, Great question. So um, actually it was one of my uh, rehab therapists who mentioned kind of core strength. And then from that conversation, you know, she's the one who mentions to me, Hey, have you tried yoga? I thought, I'm not doing yoga. Come on. No, but I'm not, I, I'm not that kind of person. I don't do yoga. Um, she's like, Hey, you really need to give it a try. And it's much harder than you think it is. Um, and I said, okay, um, you're, you're in charge of my care and I trust you. And I had developed a great relationship with her at that time. I said, sure, I'll give it a try. Um, mentally, emotionally, I was not in a good place. Um, I felt kind of lost without the job. Um, it had become my identity. I was still in it. Right. I was still in that, you know, first 10 years and it's, you know, rah, rah. And, and, uh, this is who I am. I'm a cop on duty and off duty and I'm a cop before I'm anything else. Um, cause that's super healthy for us. <laughs> right. Yes. And I just, I felt alone and, you know, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. And when you're not behind seven 11 at 3 AM, you know, smoking and joking with the guys and drinking really crappy coffee. Um, what do you have? And for me, again, I, I just, Hey, this was my family. This is my blue family. And now like they're not here and I'm not in briefing and I'm not connected. And it's really interesting when someone goes off of work for whatever reason, uh, whether it's IOD, whether it's administrative, whatever it is, we have a tendency to forget about them. And peer support wasn't a thing back then. Um, it, It just, it wasn't where there was someone who said, Hey, can you reach out? How's she doing? And even your friends. Um, cell phones weren't as big of a thing. I mean, we had Nextels back then. This is how long ago this <laughs> was, right? Um, you, know, you get the occasional, hey, what's up? You know, how's it going? 
But then those start to become fewer and far between, especially when you're off for an extended period of time like I was. I wasn't going to the range. I wasn't going to training days. Um, I really missed that interaction. And so that was one of the hardest parts for me. And the rest of it was physical pain. Um, Being in chronic pain changes your entire demeanor. It changes the way you interact with other people. It changes your relationships. Um, Because when you're always on edge, you're just pissed. And um, I had really, really, really significant challenges with dealing with my physical pain. Um, And beyond that, sad really sad because I didn't know what else to do and I was scared super scared because I was so vulnerable I'm hurt I'm injured I have nothing to fall back on and now I'm going to be retired and how am I going to afford my house how am I going to pay for um, you know my family how are my husband and I going to survive Um, and so those were all the things going through my mind and nobody could give me hard answers for any of those questions and I think the anxiety of it all and the not knowing and the fear and the uncertainty um, are what kind of really you know, heightened that, that state of agitation and then dealing with all of it together. Um, it really just is this recipe for disaster and it starts to compound. And so for me, I started to eat. I was like, Hey, comfort food. I'm here for it. Let's have it. Um, and it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a healthy, it wasn't a healthy coping. Um, but that's how I did. And when I was able to go back, um, then I had additional challenges of, okay, well now I've gained 70 plus pounds. Now I'm, you know, (laughs) you're wearing a 30 pound gun belt. You're wearing, you know, uh, three or four or five or however many pounds your, your vest is. And then having the trauma plates, you know, those are always heavy. So you have, you know, 35 plus pounds on a body that you mentioned is petite. So thank you. Um, (laughs) but back then, well, you did say you were going to pay me to say that. Exactly. And I'll pay later. Um, but when you have, so for every, for every pound of weight, it puts several more pounds of pressure on your joints. So I, at that time was kind of pushing around 200 pounds um, for someone of my frame. I had never been that big uh, for me. It was not healthy. It was not comfortable. Didn't feel good, but I couldn't do anything to overcome it. So again, I started to eat and more I ate, you know, the worse I felt and then the more I would eat again and not being able to go to the gym, not being able to walk, not being able to go up and down the stairs. Um, so putting all this weight back on and then going back to work and then putting another 30 pounds of, of weight on, it was excruciating by the end of my shift. Um, because you know, the shoulder, the back, the back is already compressed. Um, the neck is already compressed. And when we wear our, our vests, I mean, I don't know about any of the viewers out here, but I know when I wear my vest, I almost feel like this. And so you're, you're constantly, your shoulders are up, you're tense, and then your neck kind of gets in this really weird position. It's almost like tech neck, you know, (laughs) so the folks now that are doing this all the time, you know, our necks are kind of in this position all the time and it's uncomfortable. And if you stay, um, you know, like that for what? or a while, I know they're studying whether or not, um, you know, that has long-term impacts, but it can't be good for us. And so well, I just, I think back to leaving the road, going into the detective bureau mm-hmm. and being off the road for six months or so, and then pulling an overtime shift and putting all the <laughs> gear back on. You're like, Ow. how did I wear this? I Everything hurts. Yes. Exactly. Standing there. And all of a sudden your hips are, just, yeah. Right. So no, I get it. And the bruises and the, <laughs> you know, I think I still have indents on my shins from my, my combat boots. Um, but yeah, it was just a very, very, very uncomfortable and, and even more excruciating because I was adding, you know, again, 30 plus more pounds of weight on top of the 70 pounds I had gained on top of my already existing frame. And so um, that was a big time struggle for me. And I started to not sleep well, maybe start drinking a little more than I should have. And I really just didn't know how I was going to cope. And, and I couldn't, I couldn't see my way out of it. And I didn't have the support at the time. Um, from the organization, because again, peer support wasn't a thing. Right. And it was just like, Hey buddy, pal, you'll be back. Like, Hey, see ya. Can't wait. Can't wait for you to be back in briefing. Um, as they're passing you in the hallway. Exactly. And, and, and those things, again, it's out of sight, out of mind. And so one of the big things, um, you know, that I would say that is if anyone in your agency is going through that or anyone that is injured or has been involved in a critical incident, you don't have to talk about the incident. Just talk to them. I just talk to them. They're your partners. They're your people. I mean, you take a bullet for these people and then all of a sudden we just kind of forget about them once, you know, 
they're off work and, and uh, we need to kind of change that. And I believe that's changing. I believe that we've moved away from this very traditional public safety, you know, suck it up and, and uh, move on into this now kind of emerging um, public safety culture where we actually care for the individual because we understand that we hire from the human race and we understand that people are fallible and we understand that people have needs. And as we move through, um, as they move through their careers, you know, they're going to have different needs at different stages of, uh, of their career. So I think that we're doing a much better job than we did back then. So you, you ended up getting back and you spent another four years with your first agency. Yes. At the end of that four years, how did you feel mentally and physically? Did you feel like you were kind of back to close to 100 percent or were you still struggling? No, I did. I, I felt good. I felt fit. Um, I, had, I had lost all of the weight that I had gained. Um, got back kind of a more healthy relationship with food. Um, didn't focus on it. Wasn't drinking as much. Um, and I felt good. I felt really good. I was young. I was, you know, early 30s at, now at this stage. And... I was on top of the world. Um, I, I felt great. I knew I was going to, um, you know, back to Orange County where my roots were, where my family was. And so that was all very exciting. And so felt really good. Um, started at my agency. Um, and I had an incredible career. I, I did everything I wanted to do. Um, retired as lieutenant. and Was, I was promoting a, a goal of yours from the get-go? Not really. Um, you know, there were people who remained in patrol for their entire careers, and they were some of the smartest, most insightful people that I've ever known. Um, but as I kind of, I wouldn't say mastered one thing, I just kind of thought, well, I've done everything that I can do here, so let's see what's next. And really, it's just more about making myself better, but also the organization better. And... I didn't, but I didn't start saying I have to attain this rank before I retire. That was never, that was never in my plan, if you will. Um, but then as I started to, you know, it's, it's someone once shared with me um, that your view of an organization depends on your place in the organization. And as I kind of moved through the different positions in the organization and I moved through the different ranks in the, posi- in the organization, I thought, ah, oh, now I understand. Now I get it. And now I understand why this decision was made. And I was very short-sighted early in my career. Um, I, I We all was, are. Absolutely. I was like, oh, how could they do this to me? You know, I got, I got written up for crashing my car in my pursuit where I almost died. And I was angry. I was like, what? I got written up for the first time in my entire life. And uh, what? And I remember the lieutenant. It was only because it had 44 miles on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if it, it had 440, they had, no, they thanks for not. crashing it. Exactly. But I remember the lieutenant called me in when I got back to work. And, you know, again, I'd been gone for almost nine months. And he's like, come in here, young lady. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, walking in there and you know, he slides it across the table. And I see, you know, disciplinary action. I'm like, huh? What? Are you kidding me? And I thought, whoop, lock it up. <laughs> lock it up. There may be something I don't understand. So I said, sir, I understand. And I signed it said to me, young lady, if it was up to me, I'd have a dollar of doc from your paycheck for every two weeks until this car was paid for. I thought, well, that was unnecessary, <laughs> especially since my entire life's trajectory changed as a result of that crash. But that's that old school, suck it up, Adam 12, drag net, you know, kind of mentality. And he was super old school. You screwed up. You got to pay for it. hundred percent. hundred percent. Um, and as I started to promote, I then understood, now I get what he was saying. It's accountability, it's personal accountability, it's organizational accountability, and I understand. But I didn't understand back then, and I was mad. And, and none of us do. And, right. and when you're at the bottom of the food chain, mm-hmm. your bubble's very small. It's, it's basically my bubble and my immediate team. Right. And then as you move up, you, you, you're forced into looking in a more global view. Yes. But I think, at least from my experience, one of the things that I've really come to cherish in moving up is that ability to take care of the people working for me. Absolutely. And listening to your story, I think about it, having been in law enforcement since you started, and I can look at it today, is 
that change, that change of there's more of a concerted effort to take care of people. Yes, absolutely. It's not across the board. I'm sure there's still organizations sure. out there that, you know, they, they haven't adopted that right. model. Right. But for the most part, it is definitely changing. Well, and we really have to. I mean, in, in you know, times right now where recruitment and retention are such issues, you know, we can't do it the way we've always done it. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, right? So what are we doing to attract quality humans to this profession? And we can't do what we've always done. So thinking outside the box and showing people that are potential candidates, hey, we care about you. We care for you. We care for you holistically, not just because you're a warm body that fills a car. Um, and so wellness programs, you know, EAP, peer support, all of these different things that we didn't have when we started mm -hmm. are now kind of becoming the norm. And I'm so here for it. And I'm really excited that, that that's going to be the future of policing and public safety. For me personally, if I could go back and do it all over again, I honestly believe it starts when a, when a trainee is in their car with their, with their training officer. We need to make it the norm that a training officer, instead of belittling or putting them down. Right. Hey, how'd that call make you feel? Or right. How are you doing with that call that we were just on? Right. You know, but we tried to wash them out. Mm -hmm. That was the wash them out culture. Yeah. And there were certain FTOs that you always knew were the ax people, right? Hey, if you get that FTO, oof, <laughs> you're, you're done. You're done for. You're getting, hey, you're you, getting you, rolled you, up. <laughs> you're going to be using that posse box because <laughs> you're not going to be here longer. Can I get that? Exactly. Hey, can I have your locker when you're done? <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. And, and it really starts with training. And, you know, one of the things I talk about often um, when I talk about vicarious trauma and secondary traumatic stress is, you know, in the academy when I was there, so it was 94 and then into 95 and I graduated in 95, got hired in 95. But we had eight hours on emotionally disturbed persons. That was a learning domain. Nowhere in there did we talk about nutrition we eat really crappy food, right? I worked graveyard for 10 years. What's open? Taco Bell, Del Taco, Jack in the Box, right? The, I mean, some of, no offense to those places, wonderful stuff. It kept me sustained for 10 years, but at the end of the day. It tastes really good at three o'clock in the morning. It is amazing. Those tacos are amazing, by the way. Um, but, you know, packing your lunch wasn't a thing then, and it wasn't the cool kid thing to do, and meal prepping certainly wasn't a thing back then. Um, but we don't talk about nutrition. We don't talk about um, our mental health and wellness. We don't talk about, well, when you went to that first, you know, call where you did CPR on a baby not breathing, how are you doing? How did that make you feel? Or when you're doing CPR and you feel, you know, ribs don't really crack, but you feel the cartilage crack and the ribs crack, right? How are, how are you? Not, hey, we got five calls holding. Come on, let's go. We got, we got stuff to do. Um, very significant call for me. And I, I remember vividly and, and I've, I've learned a lot more about trauma since then, but it was a call where a uh, husband had um, murdered his entire family and he had seven children at the time and he killed them methodically um, in a variety of ways. And, and then he set them all on fire and I was getting off work and I was still on probation of brand new. Um, and the call comes out and it's, you know, unknown trouble, 911 hang up, you know, buildings on fire. We don't have any further information, you know, your authorized code three go. Um, and I get there and it is just, again, it's just chaos and smoke and flames and fire. And so myself and my partners, we go in and, you know, sadly the children had already, had already died. And, um, we ended up arresting the father, finding all of the bodies once everything was said and done and over. But after he killed each of the children, he had stacked them in the bathtub on top of each other, one on top of the other, one on top of the other. And the little one, um, gosh, maybe two or three years old at the time, had um, an ax um, in the middle of his forehead. And the smell, the sounds, the sight, the, I'm so new, I'm in, you know, I'm 21, 22 years old, right? I'm a baby. Um, never seen anything like that in my life. And for days and days and days, I couldn't get the smell of the fire out of, of my nose. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I didn't sleep. Um, I, and I had a partner at the time and I was like, hey, like I need, <laughs> I'm tired. Oh, just take some z or NyQuil or you'll be fine. Well, what? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> you just need some sleep. You'll be fine. 
But every time I close my eyes, I could see this over and over and over again. And so uh, one of the things I've since learned is in dealing with trauma and how your brain processes and imprints traumatic memories is that of all of your senses, smell is the only thing that bypasses your olfactory everything and goes in and goes directly to the amygdala. So that's why when we smell certain things, we're transported back. Mm. And so, you know, certain flowers will remind you of, you know, perhaps a funeral or certain smells will remind you of a really wonderful memory. Um, and again, that's because it just bypasses everything and it goes directly to the amygdala. So really, really, really interesting. But in order to understand and work through and process all of that stuff, I started becoming fascinated with, with trauma and neurobiology and traumatic memories and um, the academics of it all. And um, then I just decided, okay, well, since we're not doing it in the academies, since we didn't get any information about this before, since we've been through all of these different events, I'm going to take all of this information and I'm going to go back to school, but then I'm also going to write about it someday. And it was always, the book was always a someday bucket list. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have gotten to write it, but I think that since I've written it, I've really seen a change in the way that we are dealing with academy recruits now as far as mental health and wellness and there are actually now day-long presenters that talk about trauma vicarious trauma and secondary traumatic stress and I would have loved to have had that when we were going through it um, and I'm so glad that we're doing that now for our our incoming recruits well and, and having read your book and, and for those who have not seen it it's 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 not a big book it's not a thick book what I in reading it, I was thinking back to myself when I was in the academy. And if somebody would have given me this and said, hey, it, it may seem cheesy, right. just read this. And it's a couple pages that talks about taking care of yourself physically, right. taking care of yourself mentally. It doesn't bombard you with information to where you're, you know, seven chapters later, <laughs> you know, you should go talk to a shrink. No, it's just, it puts, it plants that seed. Mm -hmm. And then you just, it's something you could go back to. Hey, what do I need to do? You know, kind of deal. I, I think it would be a good book to, to issue to, to new recruits. And one of the things you address is you experienced your trauma when you were very young. And that's the dichotomy of law enforcement in that we're looking to hire type A's. We need yes. people who can maintain composure and maintain control in stressful situations. But the extreme opposite of that is we put young people into situations that the average person shouldn't ever have to experience. And then we don't ever do anything on the back end and go, how did that, how, how was that experience? Right. Hey, you've got three calls holding. You're going to clear soon. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. And dispatch is pinging you, right? Yeah. Like, hey, let's move on. Let's come on. Come on. It's time to go. Um, so yeah, I, I am, I'm, I'm thrilled to see it. I hope that the book can be of some help. Um, again, for me, I need to understand the why behind the what. And so for me to understand, okay, what's happening to me? What's happening to my partners? Um, are we going to survive, you know, the rest of our careers? And are we going to be happy on the other side of that? And I was seeing retirees and they're just so, they were so angry. They were just crusty and salty and angry. What's your retirement plan? <laughs> just to make it to just retirement. To <laughs> and, you know, you'd ask them how they are. Well, you know, every day above ground is a good one. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Um, but I wanted more than that. And I wanted more for myself than that. And I didn't want... Not a lot of rainbows and unicorns <laughs> with those people. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. But I also didn't want the other side of my life to be that. I didn't want the job to take away so much from me that I lost all the joy in living. Um and sadly, I think that some people get stuck in that. And I, I think that when they do get to the other side of it, they're just so grateful to be there that, again, they've lost themselves. They've lost their families. You know, the rates of um, law enforcement marriages that end in divorce are between 60 to 75 percent of first time first responder marriages as you go into your second and third marriages. And we all know people who have been in their second and third marriages it's 60%. And then the third marriage is upwards of 75% of them end in divorce. And when you think about why we're letting kind of these demons run rampant, what do we have on the other side of it? We have our family. And who do we push away when we're going through it? We push away our family. We push away our kids, our friends. Uh, we silo ourselves. We, we just 
we just can't imagine for a moment doing something else for someone else when we're off work, right? And we have this hypervigilance that continues. You know, we're up and up and up and up and up, and we have these bloods of cortisol for so long, and we don't know what to do without it. And um, those were the things I wanted answers to. Those are the questions, the burning questions I had that, you know, I want to be happy and healthy and I want to travel and I want to spend time with my family and my kids and my dog and I want to do all the cool things and I want to have joy in my life because, you know, we're really here for a very short time mm -hmm. and, um, you know, to, to have the rest of your days sad and in pain and in distress, nobody wants that. And also the suicide rates are alarmingly high uh, for first responders and, one of the things that I've kind of committed myself to in the afterlife is um, is helping with suicide awareness and prevention for first responders, um, but also kind of decreasing that curve because, again, we are looking at numbers right now that are astronomically high for retirees that are five years or less post-retirement. Um, and that's really sad. I think, unfortunately, we're, we're still there's still a large portion of our community that is that old school generation yeah. and not saying that some of the younger men and women doing the job aren't doing this too. But as you mentioned earlier, they're making this job, their complete identity right. when they're not working. The only other people they're associating with are other law enforcement or other first responders. Right. And I, I don't want to put a blanket statement and saying that that's just bad, but you do need a balance in your life. You right. need, and I, and I often say this to people, the best part of law enforcement is when you can get off patrol and go work detectives and work Monday through Friday, eight to five, like right. all your normal friends right. and be able to go to the normal social dinners on Friday nights and right. Saturday nights, as opposed to, Hey, you want to get together on Tuesday at, you know, no, I got to work, <laughs> you know, the rest of the world is working when you're not. Right. And so the only right. people you can hang out with are other, you know, first right. responders. Right. And it also helps to solidify that kind of us against them mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, look, like nobody understands us because we are only off on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And, you know, we work nights and we deal with the dregs of society and we do this. And But to your point, having friends and having a social support outside of the job will help you be grounded. It also gives you great perspective because you understand, you know, there is life beyond this and there is life outside of, you know, my patrol car and there is life outside of my department and my organization. And there are incredible things to experience and there are wonderful things that will bring you joy. And we just need to understand that we need to, you know, survive long enough to get there. That is true. Yeah. You did ultimately how many years? 25. 25. Mm -hmm. You've now got your PhD. Yes. When did, I know you mentioned when you first got injured, you thought, okay, let me go back and, and start working towards my associates. As far as advanced education, all the way to a PhD, yes. what was the catalyst for that? So after I got my associates, that was, gosh, probably early 2000s. And then I decided, I'm going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, it's very humbling to have a 12-year-old tutor you in statistics, by the way, when you're in your 20s. Let me just share. Uh, super humbling. And I thought, oh, I'm not smart enough. And, you know, I just, I, I got my associates and I'm good. And then I thought, you know, if I'm going to do anything that is going to personally enhance my ability to be a better person, a better you know, supervisor someday, better detective, better mom, better daughter, better sister, um, I found a lot of intrinsic value in going to school because it gave me that perspective that I was lacking being in it, right? Working graveyard for 10 years, you know, kicking doors, driving fast, you know, making the arrests. It was really great. But again, that was my little microcosm and I didn't see anything outside of it. So that afforded me the ability to see, wow, there's all, there's a whole other experience out here and it's not just law enforcement. And it helps me again, I think be, be better, more diverse, but also just a better person all the way around, a more educated, more informed person, partner, et cetera. So I went and got my teaching credential at Cal State Long Beach and um, got my bachelor's degree uh, at Cal State Long Beach. And I thought, okay, well, I'll be an adjunct professor when I'm done. Um, at the time, I was teaching um, at Fullerton College and um, for University of Phoenix and a couple of other um, places. And I just decided, you know, teaching's cool. And this is what I'm going to do. So I'm like, okay. So master's degree comes up 
And at the time, uh, Chapman University was kind of touring and making the rounds in Orange County and saying, hey, we'll, we'll bring classes to you. And it really was this first time that, you know, hybrid or kind of, you know, asynchronous education was really something. And it was like, wow, my department is not only going to bring it to us, we're going to have our own cohort of my friends, my partners and colleagues. They can grow and be amazing together too. And then we can all have this really incredible experience. Oh, and, um, you know, by the way, you know, we'll bring it like to the briefing room. So when you get off work, you just go down to the locker room, change, come back up and you, you know, spend your next four hours here. I mean, they literally handed us education on a silver platter. And I thought, well, if I don't take advantage of this, I'm just a fool. So I got my master's in criminology. And then I decided I'm really done now. Super done. So done. Never going to school again. And I don't know, I got this wild bug in 2011. And I started researching PhD programs because I thought, you know, in the afterlife, uh, I'm going to move to the South and I'm going to be a professor. And looking at some of the job opportunities at that time really required you to have a PhD in order to teach at a university level and to get tenure as, as, you know, as a tenure track professor. So I thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So I tell my husband, I said, honey, I'm back at this point, I'm working special victims. So I'm in the detective bureau, um, you know, have my Fridays and Saturdays off when I'm not getting called in and, you know, nights and weekends, I'm going to be able to, to work on this, on this doctorate and it's going to take me, you know, 10 years. So I tell him, I said, honey, I think I'm going to get my PhD. He's like, sure, honey. Okay. <laughs> Whatever works for you. I said, oh, and by the way, I've already signed up. I've already taken the entrance exam. And by the way, I start January 1st. He's like, you what? <laughs> so, and he was such a, a trooper throughout that journey. Um, I ended up promoting um, during that time, went back to patrol. I was working weekend nights again, because as you know, we started at the bottom of the barrel again. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm- Here's your reward for promoting. Go <laughs> exactly, back to being junior. Exactly. So I'm working, I think, Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights now. Um, but it allowed me Monday through Thursday to go to school full time. So I was able to actually accelerate and go to school and take a full load, go full time and still work full time. So I was able to complete my doctorate in um, a little over five years, and um, it was perfect timing. It was a couple of years before I knew I was going to be retiring. Um, I promoted to lieutenant um, right before I retired, and then I had my doctorate. So when I retired, I literally left, and I started the next week as the dean of criminology and criminal justice at a local university in Orange County. And that was going to be my question. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned that your desire was to teach. Mm -hmm. When did it switch and did you start looking at, well, maybe I'll be the dean of the program. And how did that come about? Oh, gosh. Well, it was really because I was kind of uninformed. I thought, oh, the dean, like, how cool is that to be a dean? I get to go into the classroom and I get to teach whenever I want. Yeah, no. no. Yeah, no, not so much. Um, you're a manager. I was going to say, pretty people. much you're just an administrator, admin. right? <laughs> right. <laughs> You're the manager of people and you're administrative and you're taking student complaints and you're dealing with student issues and, and all the things. Um, and it was an incredible opportunity and it was a wonderful landing uh, for me because again, it was criminology, it was criminal justice. I was working with my people and you know, I was working with law enforcement who were attaining, you know, either uh, bachelor's or advanced level degrees. And so it was perfect. And then I had an opportunity, uh, the university was going to be selling. And the owners of the university were um, so grateful to all of their staff. And they said, hey, we really want to focus on trauma, but we want to focus on trauma in first responder and military populations. And we think you would be the perfect person to run this institute. So the Hecht Trauma Institute was born um, in the summer of 2020. Um, this is, again, in COVID, during post-COVID, we had all transitioned to remote. And so we weren't in the classroom anymore. We weren't doing things in person anymore. We weren't interacting. Um, and again, it wasn't just us. It was the entire world. And there was really kind of this, this um, new experience that communities were involving themselves in that was bringing trauma now home. And it's trauma of not only having the world shut down, it's all the anxiety and the fear and all the things that happened with COVID. And I mean, we can all think back to a time that we were scared. We were scared in March of 2020. And I just thought, wow, trauma not only deeply impacts our current scenario, 
but thinking back on how trauma trauma brought me to the job. And I think a lot of first responders come to the job with trauma. And that is one reason why they get into the profession. Um, And again, I'm not making a blanket statement for everyone, but I feel like the helping professions, you have statistically, you have more traumatized individuals that are in the helping professions because they don't want to see that injustice anymore. They don't want to see someone else be victimized. They don't want to see another vulnerable population hurt. And so they're going to be the ones to change it. And I think a lot of us, again, bring trauma to the job. But even if we don't, look at your everyday workplaces in, in, in corporate. You have people that have brought their experiences from childhood, or we call adverse childhood experiences. They bring them to the workplace. We are dealing with traumatized individuals each and every day, no matter what our profession. And it really transcends um, public or private sector. So having the opportunity to work in the field of trauma, um, I decided to, again, because PhD wasn't enough. Uh, I decided to go back. It You're really, an underachiever, I, I, aren't for you? For sure. And it really just shows you that I don't know what I want to do when I grow up, right? And so that's why I try all these different things. Um, so I ended up uh, going to Florida State University, and I ended up getting two um, professional certifications in trauma and resilience um, during the time that, that, you know, COVID was in play, and that also this opportunity to um, head up the Hex Trauma Institute um, was kind of put before me. And one of the things that we focus on is, is providing education, information, and services. Um, and while we do that for general populations and, and communities, um, one of our kind of niche areas is providing psychoeducation for first responders and military as it relates to post-traumatic stress, um, vicarious trauma, and secondary traumatic stress. And then, you know, kind of along with that, um, we, we talk a lot about suicide prevention and awareness, and we talk a lot about uh, traumatic brain injuries and kind of the neurobiology of trauma and, and, and how that impacts us and how we get to the other side of it. Um, and it's been an incredible opportunity for me to have, you know, really taken a life spent in service to others and now serve a population that I care deeply for in a really unique way. And so, um, yeah, I've been at the Heck Trauma Institute now for a couple of years and um, we have been working a lot with um, military veterans and first responders on these mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques. So we have kind of these live didactic um, experiences where, you know, we teach trauma-informed yoga, we teach, you know, tactical breathing, and you put the word tactical in front of anything, <laughs> and cops are all about it, right? Um, it's really called box breathing, and they use it a lot in sports um, and a lot on the range. So, you know, um, talking about, you know, just controlling your breath and and really just kind of taking that time to self-regulate and it's really one of the things that when I talk to either recruits or officers or when I teach a post class on cultural um, competence and and resilience for law enforcement you know it's really one of the things that we can do right now immediately post incident to self-regulate and box breathing is you know four breaths in hold four breaths out hold four breaths in hold four breaths out, hold. But what it also does internally and physiologically is it also brings you back to center. And it also allows us to, you know, not that we're going to move through that trauma and move on to the next call or to the next thing, but in that moment we can be okay enough to bring ourselves back down in a, a more regulated state to handle the next critical thing that happens. So it's really, really, really been a great way to, to really kind of round out a really amazing career. For somebody wanting to get involved in the program, is it only in person or do you do remote? We do. We do. So we have a lot of virtual webinars and presentations. Um, we are certified by POST um, to office to offer, officer, <laughs> to offer um, resilience courses for law enforcement, um, both active and, and retired. Um, we also do a lot of work with community corrections um, through the board of um, California um, and state corrections. And then we have a lot of um, on-demand content. We have meditations. We have trauma-informed yoga classes. We have things that are either self-guided or we have on-demand content. And then we also offer live um, virtual. And then we also offer live in person. So um, a lot of stuff um, is, is on our website and it's already embedded there for their free tools and resources that really any first responder, or any military veteran, really anyone um, in the community who's interested in, in learning more about trauma-informed yoga and meditation can download or view at their leisure. What's the website for someone to find that? It is www.thehti.org. 
and I'll include that in the show notes. If anybody's got any further questions for you, what's the best way to reach out to you? Um, I am happy to provide email. I have um, my email in my book as well. It's Catherine Hamill, PhD at gmail.com. And I'll include that in the show notes also. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything that you're doing for first responders and appreciate you immensely. I appreciate you watching. But before you go, if you like the video, please hit that subscribe button. Also, any comments are appreciated. Thank you.